My name is John Dodson. I graduated from college in 1954 and came to work for RCA. After the training program, I was assigned to the Missile and Surface Radar Division in Morristown. I uh, worked there for 20 years and then transferred to Camden to work with the uh, RCA team from Burlington and Camden in the classified communications business. I retired in 1994, and uh, right now I'm enjoying my life as a retiree. Very good. Um, the first project you worked on when you showed up, I presume, right out of school, what was it like? <laughs> it was um, pretty scary for me, but uh, I worked on uh, receivers for the uh, instrumentation radars that were used at uh, in um, uh, Los Alamos and in, uh, on the downrange stuff for damp. And about the most interesting thing that happened to me besides from working on a little chassis was uh, I managed to meet uh, General Sarnoff in the uh, model shop at uh, Morristown. And I didn't really know that much about him, but um, it was a pretty impressive uh, thing to get to meet him. And after after the uh, instrumentation radars were, they were still going along their way, but the news came in as a, our big program. And it was, uh, I worked on Bemuse, uh, all the way through Bemuse uh, until the, basically the whole program. And that was uh, probably the, the biggest program that I worked on. Uh, following Bemuse, the, uh, they were, they were, they, we were having, having a hard time with getting new jobs. And the departments were given the business opportunities on their own rather than having marketing go out and get them. And our, our department under Marty Corson and Jim Sullivan, who were two terrific people, uh, assigned me to read the con Congress Congressional Business label, uh, Letter every day to try to search out new business. It's, you know, it's like cold calling your customers. And we found a, uh, an award from uh, Rome Air Development Center for a new, uh, they called it the Wide Band Exciter. We had to write a letter to get approved. We got approved and then we wrote a proposal only one, uh, mostly because I think we underbid the other competitor. But, but we ended up working through that and uh, we, we struck up about a two or three year relationship where we got add on business that uh, kept us from having, it basically stopped the layoffs in our department. And uh, after that, Aegis came along, and uh, that was a, you know, that became a really big effort, although my, my uh, contributions to Aegis were only as a troubleshooter. I was, I got into the, uh, more into the tactical radar business, and then we got into the two pound radar, which we, Ended up in funny places like Pigeon Rouge, Arkansas, and Eglin Air Force Base, places like that, trying to pedal the two pound radar, which actually weighed 10 pounds. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we managed to sell about 300 of those. And uh, uh, that was about the time, if, excluding the video uh, disc, uh, that was about the end of my assignments in Morristown. We moved, I moved into Camden with uh, all of Jim Solomon's group and we teamed with uh, RCA Camden and RCA Burlington to win a contract with a classified customer. And that, that turned out to be a, a very interesting 20 years. We worked with really good people from, in us, from our customer in the South, I shouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, I was really impressed with them. I think they were probably the best people we ever worked with. They were competent, they were uh, extremely, had a extremely high ethics, and uh, they, were, they were a pleasure to do business with. Mm -hmm. And there was some nice traveling and some funny things that happened in there, but probably can't talk about them because of the locations. So that, that's, that's about it for... Mm -hmm. um. When you first started, did you have a mentor or anything like that? Uh, I ended up being Jim Sullivan, who 
I worked for him as a, he was my leader, he was my manager and uh, over the years and he was, as he, he was uh, the head of systems engineering, I, I worked for him along with, uh, my, he was, he and Maurice Temkin who, you know, the closest friends I had in, in my uh, total career. What was Jimmy like? Uh, first of all, he's probably the finest man I ever met. And he had a unique way of uh, doing business. He never, he was always able to go in and get something done without hurting anybody's feelings. He, if he, if he had a lot of jobs where he had to go in and actually, you know, take over a job that had been failed for one reason or another. And it was, he never blamed anybody. He just went in and said, here we go. This is how we're going to get out of this together. And, and it was beautiful. I thought he was really terrific. He, uh, I think we would have lost the, the classified program had it not been for his relationship with some of our customer. And I also believe that he allowed us to get access that we could never have gotten except for their trust in him. Mm -hmm. so, he was about as good as it gets. What about your co-workers? Uh, I think I was privileged to work with what I thought was the best engineering team in the world. Uh, George, you, you probably don't know him, Jim. Most of them are going to be from Moorestown. But uh, besides Jim Sullivan, there was George Stevens. There was Dean Gamakis. And then in, in Andy Chrysanthus, who unfortunately died early. But in Camden, Conrad Haber, I, I think he is a fantastic engineer. And, yeah. um, what was the work environment like at RCA? I, I thought it was pretty good and I met, I did work for some other companies later in my career and it was a completely, I felt a completely different uh, atmosphere. Morristown, I always thought was very cooperative. People would help one another. People would sacrifice for your job. They were, they, they did a, I think they did a great job. And I think they were, Tom Howard was a, one of the best engineers. And for, you know, unfortunately, he committed suicide while, while working. It was, it was a terrible loss. Uh, but uh, we teamed with two different companies and one company was very good technically but they were absolutely horrible to work with. They, uh, they were like all individuals. They, they, didn't work together, they didn't work with one another and they didn't work with us. And it was very hard getting anything done. The other company was ethically uh, bad and not too good technically. Mm -hmm. So we, we only teamed with them once, so that was about as bad as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, outside of work, did you ever associate with any of your co-workers? Yeah, when particularly at Morristown, we were all younger and uh, we formed, uh, you know, sport and dinner associations. We went to baseball games together, we bowled, we had parties. Uh, as we all got older, the, we centered on uh, maybe three or four, like the Temkins, uh, the Rippies who I had talked to you about, uh, and the Sullivans, uh, you know, pretty much uh, like that. And we, we had a fair-sized family. They all, they all had fair-sized families, so we were pretty busy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what about, we've heard this term come up again and again, the RCA family. Does that mean anything to you? It did, and I, I think it would not probably survive in this environment. But the RCA family and me, we had, an engineer was working for me, George Armbruster. He had his... I think his second heart attack, he couldn't come to work. And I used to take his paychecks to him for two years to, to, to get re 
recovered and could come back to work. I don't think there'd be many companies doing that now. I think they and one of my one of our managers, Marty Corson, he he virtually put my uh, oldest daughter through college by allowing her to work, and uh, during not only during the summer but uh, over Christmas vacations and you name it. So she's one of I think she's our only only child that didn't didn't have a debt when she came out of college. So. What about your supervisors? What was it like to work for them? Uh, I only worked for one, Jim Sullivan. That's <laughs> all. So it was nice. Mm -hmm. We spent 40 years with the same supervisor. Um, you just made a passing reference to the video disc, but we've learned a lot about it, <clears throat> and we've already seen how it became a huge failure for RCA. Um, what was your association with a video disc, and, and, and what was it like? Why do you think it failed? Uh, <clears throat> we were involved because our general manager uh, volunteered our services to uh, Princeton and to Consumer Electronics. The, uh, the basic problem, they, they, the basic decision that was made that was wrong was not to use a laser contact for the uh, making of the disc. Uh, RCA elected to use uh, contact recording and the, um, the uh, cutter for the disc uh, at best could run at 33 to 1 real time. So if you had to go for an hour, one an hour program, it took 33 hours, which was totally impractical. So what they had hoped to do was to continue to improve the cutter, but they didn't know where they were going to end up. So they asked us to build a piece of equipment that would uh, digitize the information, the raw material off the di uh, videotape, of a tape recorder, we would digitize it and then we could play it back at any speed that the, the cutter happened to end up at. Uh, we also were supposed to have a, uh, an enhancement box that Princeton Labs was going to make to put in series with the readout so that they could, I guess, emphasize color and more, more, give it more definition. We never saw that. We never made <laughs> that. never got delivered. Uh, Princeton was in was involved as a, a technical like overseer and I, I believe there was two schools of thought there one was in favor of the using this the contact recording and the present cutter and another group was pushing something else which involved a flying spot scanner which i i never found out what it was or what's into it but they were it, it seemed like there was a lot of tension between some groups and even for something as simple as buying, buying the A to D converter, uh, there was only two units in the country that would work. One was completely linear and one was an interpreter. So we picked the completely linear one, but we had to go to, to Princeton and deliver, hook it up, play material into it, play it back and let them judge which was the better picture. So we did that. But the uh, time just passed and uh, the finally the cutter got to be two to one, and they said, "Okay, we can do it." And the, but then they didn't, they didn't need the slowdown, so they could just that was it for us. But when they completed making the disc, they found out that uh, they were, the Indianapolis had didn't have any software material. They had Elmer Fudd and somebody else, and. It, they had to go off. Then they just basically stopped the program and went off to uh, try to get some software material that they could actually sell. So uh, that was about the end of ours. The, the funniest part was the this, this story I told you a little bit earlier about when Jim and I went over to accept our honors and awards for getting this job. And uh, Mr. Lair proceeded to tell us that we overran the program, both of us would be fired. And instead of getting the, the big pat on the back we thought we were going to get, we ran back out of the office to try to find out what we were going to do. But 
that was about the, we had virtually no uh, say in what was done regarding the test. We just built a little machine and hoped that it would be used. So basically they just took Jimmy and his team and stuffed them into this area to make it work. Is that what yeah. I hear? Yeah, we were, there was only three of us. It was Jim and Tom Bolger, who was a great engineer, and myself. And we bought the, uh, it was a pretty simple thing. We bought the, the video recorder from Ampex, and uh, we actually measured the specs on the Ampex machine, and it didn't work. They didn't meet their specs, so we called up their uh, consult, their representative, and the guy says, you're the first guys that ever measured the, uh, the things, but Ampex did the right thing. They went back and they fixed the, the uh, they got their dynamic range the right thing, they fixed it all up, then they, then they went on and used that to, to sell as a competitor against us, of course. But we used that, and uh, all we had to do was just convert it over to, to whatever output they wanted, but they never got around to using it. We've also mm -hmm. gotten some indications that there were some very, very long delays in mm -hmm. the development of the disk. Is that what your experience was? Yeah. Well, we were on schedule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we made sure of that, but we were, we were a, uh, you know, very low, we were a wrinkle on that whole program. Mm -hmm. they, I think we were, I think eventually if they, if they could have got them the thing down to where it could play like at say four to one or something like that, they might have given it a whirl. But the thing that took the time was to improve the, the uh, cutter mm -hmm. to get in, and when they got it down to two to one, they thought that was enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, being an engineer requires keeping up with the technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did RCA help at all with that? Yeah, they offered a lot of courses uh, and it was, pre it was pretty tough. You worked in a group that if you didn't keep up, uh, you might not be there that much longer. Um, the assessment of RCA in the technical community, what, what's your perception of that? You mean when I was working? Yes. I thought in the defense electronic business that we were, mm -hmm. I thought we were very close to the top. Okay. Probably uh, self-serving a judgment, but I did work, had some run-ins with other companies, and I think that if you counted, you know, meeting schedules and cost with the Technico, I think we were very good. Um, we've also heard from others about the RCA parties, the Christmas party, et cetera. Did you have any experience with that? Well, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> the uh, one thing I learned is never take a vote on what to serve at a Christmas party. <laughs> because you'll, you'll alienate at least 50% of the people. So we had, uh, I thought they were nice. They, uh, particularly the ones at Tavistock were, the, were nice. I guess those probably, those things aren't probably allowed anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you were here in the transition to GE. Yes. What was, what changed? What, uh, what was it like? Uh, the uh, accounting changed. The uh, much more aggressive business-wise, uh, and, the, uh, and the atmosphere changed. They were, I didn't consider them a people-friendly company. They, uh, it didn't affect me, but it affected some of my younger people that that were, had just passed, I don't know, like 35 or 40, and they were dropped off of them. They were not allowed to be in the GE, you know, fast track program. I thought that was unfair. Mm -hmm. And I, I, basically I just, I, I felt that uh, they were better suited to be in a commercial business because uh, cost plus contracts, you don't benefit yourself by, uh, laying off enough people that could be working for you. Yeah. 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 But I have, will say on, on GE's behalf that they did monitor 
all their commitments to the retirement programs and uh, things like that. Okay. Um, how would you sum up your time at RCA, your career? Was it just a job or was it more than that? Well, I like to think it was more than that. I, uh, I had a, you know, the privilege of working with some really good people and uh, on some pretty interesting jobs. I, uh, I, although I was a manager, I was never uh, in management. I was a technical manager. And uh, that made it a lot, uh, a lot nicer. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel that the RCA management valued your input? Yes. I think it was, that was one of the nice parts about it. We had a pretty, pretty reasonable exchange between, uh, you know, as managers because most of us had known one another for 40 years from the time it was over. Mm -hmm. So how did it feel to retire? Mm, great. <laughs> <laughs> we had, uh, we've been very fortunate in life. We have four children, ten grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And everybody's in pretty good shape. Good. Mm -hmm. So what was the best thing about working for RCA? I don't know. You got to work on things you enjoyed. You got to work with people you liked. Doesn't get much better than that. What was the worst thing? Uh, I don't There weren't a lot of them. There were just a few incidents of mostly with uh, managers mm -hmm. that, that were there for a short time. But most of the time it was pretty good. Good. Any uh, particular stories or incidents that you recall as you worked through mm -hmm. RCA, as you worked on the programs? Uh, I think the funniest one was with Max Lair. I, I always get a kick out of telling that one, but uh, otherwise, pretty, 